Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, thanks everyone for, uh, for coming back. <laughs> um, so now we're going to hear from a little change of pace for the next two talks. Uh, we're going to focus a little more on the actual hardware devices. Uh, so now we're going to hear from Rob Sholkoff about using cat states in a microwave cavity for quantum information. So let's welcome Rob. Okay. Thanks. So you guys are the gluttons for punishment. You're back for your second dose. Maybe a few of you were at the, the talk yesterday, too. So uh, yeah, what I thought I'd do today is give a little bit more technical talk. I'll try not to repeat material too much from, uh, from yesterday. And uh, I'll give you some specifics, but I also want to sort of pull out some, uh, uh, some general things that we're thinking about um, as we're starting to press towards the next stage, uh, which is really, I think, as I said yesterday, trying to figure out the best way to do error correction. So, um, in particular, uh, so we'll, we'll give a little review because part of the goal of today's talk is to rehabilitate the harmonic oscillator in your eyes. And, you know, it's always nice to start the day by quantizing the harmonic oscillator. Um, but uh, interestingly, you know, I think in our system, we, we sometimes talk about it as qubits, okay, and if we're in certain regimes, we can to a, a large extent, you know, view it as we really have two level systems. But that's not really the natural things for us to build in our system. Really what we build in our system, as I'll try to explain, is sets of coupled oscillator modes with varying degrees of nonlinearity. So you have to have some nonlinearity. And with interesting kinds of interactions, which are not maybe the usual things that uh, algorithm designers and quantum information theorists think of, right? I mean, a lot of the stuff I'm aware of, people say, oh, you know, take these two level systems and do these CNOTs and so on. And that's great. But uh, to me, as a hardware designer, it's really nice if I can think of a simple piece of hardware that in some sense implements uh, complicated functions autonomously or uh, naturally all at once. And that's kind of the spirit of what we're doing here. And so I want to try to explain to you that kind of crazy red, white, and blue four blobby thing uh, that was on the title slide uh, and explain to you why we think it's maybe what we call a hardware efficient way in our system to realize an error correctable logical qubit without having to build many, many Joseph's injunctions and do things kind of brute force. And then uh, I'll show you some uh, experiments along the lines for doing that, how we're encoding information in multi-photon states in a cavity. And actually, uh, about uh, the, this paper here, which is on the archive and will be in Nature in a, a week or 10 days or something, uh, which I claim is the first real-time tracking of a quantum error correctable syndrome. Uh, OK. so. Uh, I hope to be pedagogical and not pedantic, and it's a nice small audience, so please, you know, let's make it a conversation, and I'll, I'll try to go quickly until uh, someone gets, uh, gets a question. So, okay, I'm going to try and keep your intuition going, uh, uh, sort of have some pictures here of a mechanical harmonic oscillator, but of course what we really build are electrical harmonic oscillators, right, and instead of X and P, uh, our variables are Q and Phi. Uh, but they are the conjugate variables of the system, right? And then the, we do the usual thing. So uh, I'm going to sort of introduce you to this, our version of quantum optics, which is really the way we talk about and think about our systems all the time. So, OK, so that's what A and A dagger mean. And of course, uh, with phi and q, it's a bit uh, arbitrary which one you consider the position and which one you consider the momentum. Uh, but because of the way a Joseph's injunction works, it's sort of usually we like to say, OK, phi is the coordinate. Uh, because then what the Josephson effect will give us is a, a certain nonlinear potential. Does it really matter? It doesn't really matter, but then I would have to say, oh, my nonlinearity is I have a velocity-dependent mass okay. if I did it the other way, and that's just not as intuitive or common. So it's, it's absolutely true, though. It's a bit arbitrary, and you'll see people doing it either way. Uh, okay, and we quantize this thing, and it has energy levels, and it's a lovely, beautiful quantum system to work with. Uh, and since we're talking about error correction, uh, that's the goal, we're going to talk a lot about parity in several different forms, right? 
And again, this is very rudimentary, but just to remind you, when we have our oscillator and we quantize it, and we have our Fox states, that's what hey, optical physicists call these, you know, uh, states of definite number of excitation, uh, those have, you know, these well-known uh, uh, wave functions which are even or odd, depending on whether n is even or odd in terms of their uh, wave function in the coordinate space. Okay? So remember that. We'll come back to a few versions of parity. So what's the problem with harmonic oscillators or why people don't usually think about them as being useful for quantum information is, well, they are too classical in some sense because they're linear, because all these energy levels are regularly spaced. If I act on it from outside with a laser or some classical force, in our case, it'll be a microwave generator tuned to the resonance of this thing, um, we can excite the system, but what we tend to make right are the Glauber or coherent states which are superpositions of number states, and it basically uh, sort of amounts to taking your minimum uncertainty wave packet and displacing it to the right or to the left. Of course, you can do that with whatever amplitude and, and phase you want, uh, depending on uh, the amplitude and the phase of the force you use to excite the system. Okay? And we'll describe those coherent states, of course, with some complex number alpha. right? Uh, and uh, alpha squared uh, tells you sort of the average energy. This uh, uh, Glauber state, of course, is a superposition of many of the Fox states. Uh, alpha squared tells you the average energy, or n bar. Okay? And uh, notice that this state doesn't really have any particular parity, right? So, uh, uh, you know, and, and also, of course, what I do if I make this thing, uh, you know, its dynamics is kind of trivial. It just swings back and forth, right? And the only difference between the quantum oscillator and uh, uh, the classical one is that you know, this motion as it's moving back and forth is just slightly blurry by this uh, 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 uncertainty. Okay? So uh, how do we make that more fun? As I sort of alluded to yesterday, we have the Josephson junction, which uh, lets us put in nonlinearity. Okay? And uh, that means our, our oscillator now is nonlinear. We have, in fact, uh, something which is a cosine potential. And that then lets us, if we want, think of the zero and the one as the two states of our qubit and we'll never go up to the doubly excited uh, level. So if you make the sort of transmon qubits that uh, we, we do mostly in my lab, uh, that anharmonicity there is pretty large. It's a few hundred megahertz out of five gigahertz. So in 10 nanoseconds, you can really sort of spectroscopically resolve this transition uh, distinctly from that transition, okay? Do you have a formula for Hamiltonian? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, it's exactly this, right? And this is why I say, okay, the, the, the Josephson effect is giving you a nonlinear potential, right? So cosine to first order is just a parabola. But that's what I've drawn here. Uh, the next order, of course, which is important, is this uh, quartic term of, uh, of the cosine, and that's the thing which gives you the nonlinearity. And because it's the sort of a softening potential, the, the energy to add two quanta is somewhat less than twice the energy of putting in one quantum. But it doesn't really matter what the sign of the anharmonicity is, just that it's non-zero. Okay? So, so yeah, that was my first high-level point is it's a qubit, sort of, right? And, and actually, you know, a detail uh, uh, that you probably haven't heard about if you're not working in this field, right, is that almost everything we've ever done with superconducting qubits and all, most of the other groups has importantly involved many of the other uh, uh, levels. So, I mean, the way we did the two qubit gates and that algorithm I showed yesterday involved sort of at least virtually going to the two state, which is still fairly coherent uh, in, in, in the qubits, okay? So, just as, you know, uh, atomic physicists tell you it's just a two-level system, but then to do this transition, we adiabatically go through, you know, some optical transition. Well, okay, so it's the same thing here. It's all done with levels, right? Okay, so you can make these, uh, and they're nice, and they work, uh, and they're getting more and more coherent, okay? Uh, and uh, this is sort of what they looked like a couple of years ago. Uh, nowadays, this is sort of the zoom-in of a picture of one of the qubits that's working in that 3D architecture that was on my title slide. Uh, we've made the qubits bigger and bigger, which turns out to make them less and less sensitive to materials imperfections and stuff. But it really doesn't matter. We get uh, all the sort of same, it's still got one Josephson junction there. The Hamiltonian is exactly the same. The parameters are exactly the same, so you don't need to worry about those things. Okay. 
Uh, and you know, here's another version of this progression in coherence uh, with a little bit more detail. Shows both T1 and T2, and you know, you have to keep improving both of those. But also importantly, here I've added another ingredient, which is uh, you know, previously, sort of before 2011 or so, our linear oscillators and our nonlinear Josephson junction-based oscillators both had fairly equivalent Qs, or basically the same kind of coherence properties. All right? But uh, nowadays, we can get strong coupling of our qubit to a, a proper three-dimensional cavity. And we've demonstrated already single photon lifetimes in those of 10 milliseconds. And I think there's really no reason to believe we shouldn't be able to have seconds for those coherence times. If you go to Sarah Chiroche's group, right, uh, they do 50 gigahertz, one Kelvin uh, cavities that have 100 millisecond lifetime. Uh, and so, you know, we should be able, and it's an open cavity, you have to send an atomic beam. It's much harder. So we should be able to do that. And, you know, it's just sort of beginning here, but I think there's uh, really the, the, these are interesting objects because if that's, you know, if you can put your information somehow in an object that starts with much lower error rate, that should also help me out when I'm trying to do error correction. Yes, good, we have questions, that's great. Uh, right. Yes, yeah, so I had heard people say that T1 and T2 were fairly comparable, and it looks like for a lot of your thoughts they are, but suddenly at the end, your T1 is now uh, yeah, a lot so, longer. Yeah, so this last point here is, you know, uh, on the bleeding edge, so to speak. So this is a, a more complicated device from my colleague Michelle Devere's group uh, called the Fluxonium. This one has now demonstrated T1 times of a couple of milliseconds. And it also has some uh, interesting differences. It can make, for example, like a lambda system, if you know atomic physics, as opposed to just the, the transmons I've been talking about so far. Uh, it also allows you to tune with a magnetic field the, uh, the frequency. And so this point here is something where you're on a tuning curve. And we know that basically, unfortunately, the device is there acting as a magnetometer. And it's being dephased by some 1 over f noise. So if they go to a sweet spot for that, if they, make the, if they fix the frequency, this can be improved somewhat. But basically, what happens with each generation of device is, I mean, first you need to improve T1. Because if you haven't improved T1, you can't see anything. You don't know about dephasing. And then you know, if you find this situation, you say, ah, oh, let me investigate what the dephasing is and get it back up. And so the sort of iterations here are you know, improve the lifetime, reduce the dissipation then figure out if it's either homogeneously broadened and T2 is T1 or twice T1. If not, figure out what the dephasing is and bring that up. And you have to kind of keep going through this cycle. I think T2 is going to probably catch up to T1. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's sort of, we had to do these things along the way, right? Um, so, you know, in the first generation of the 3D transmons, for example, the T2 was lower. And now it's kind of caught up to the T1. And we realized that was basically due to unintentional measurements from very small backgrounds of black body photons in the cavity. And another one. Yeah, yeah so <coughs> I've got a question. With, uh, if you're introducing a cavity to shield, uh, shield these, then how do you imagine, uh, uh, do, do you imagine the volume of these cavities are going to end up posing a problem if you want a million uh, physical qubit device? Right, so uh, that's, a, that's a good question which people ask a lot. So even when we go to the full three-dimensional cavities, uh, they're about a cc in volume. Okay, and uh, so right now in our fridges, we could easily cool down a cubic meter. So that's a million of these cavities. The bigger issue, right, than making a million of these or whatever is, as David's going to talk about, wiring them, <laughs> calibrating them, controlling them, all those kinds of things. And so we have some ideas about that. We're working on um, uh, ways of sort of making three-dimensional structures and shields uh, in an integrated way. Uh, but that's a whole lot of technology that maybe we won't get into too much. OK, so even more fun uh, than uh, having your nonlinear oscillator is to couple a linear oscillator to a nonlinear oscillator. In quantum optics, uh, they call that cavity QED, right? So you have some bosonic mode here. You have your two-level atoms. So you write your A daggers and A's for your oscillator. And you say it's a sigma Z. And you have this Jane's Cummings or dipole interaction between the two. And we can get. Uh, exactly this Hamiltonian, we get very strong couplings compared to real atoms where this G, the coupling between the two things, can also be hundreds of megahertz or corresponds to 10 nanoseconds to do a coherent operation. Okay? And there are ways of implementing that. This is sort of a cartoon of the things I showed yesterday, right, where you have a planar qubit and a planar transmission line, but it equally well applies to this sort of Josephson junction with a great big dipole antenna that's 
uh, pasted inside of a three-dimensional cavity. Uh, but in the rest of the talk today, um, we're not going to think about this sort of resonant case where uh, the qubit and the cavity exchange uh, energy because they are at the same frequency. Uh, much more often now, we work in the so-called dispersive regime. Okay? And so we're going to have the frequency of my qubit or my atom being different than the frequency of my cavity or the resonator. And that difference will, in, in, in addition, be you know, large, somewhat larger uh, than G, the kind of coupling between the two elements. Okay? And what that means is you, you go to second order in perturbation theory, right? And then you get an interesting Hamiltonian like, like this, OK? Uh, so if I, uh, and, and I like to call this doubly QND, because you see the interaction between my two parts here commutes with the total Hamiltonian, right? And so this is a really nifty thing. It means we can use the cavity to do a QND measurement of the qubit or we can use the qubit to do a QND measurement of the photon number in the cavity. Okay? And that's where kind of all the fun's going to come about. And in, in addition, um, I didn't write this out, uh, but you know, if in reality, of course, the qubit here is a, a B dagger B plus some higher order terms for the, its nonlinearity, this is really A dagger A, B dagger B. It's uh, in quantum optics, they call it cross cur. Right? I guess you could also call it you know, uh, uh, a Coulomb-like interaction. Right? It says that if I excite one of the components, it changes the energy required to excite the other component. But we'll never actually trade between the two. We just have that kind of dispersive interaction between them. And so I, what's special about this? I don't know. It's a natural thing for us to build. It's not something I really see people writing about a lot in the, in the quantum informatic literature. Uh, it's similar to things in NMR, but I, it's just sort of a new and interesting Hamiltonian, as, and as I'll show you in the rest of the talk, basically there's neat things we're learning how to do with it. So the first thing you can, you can use this uh, for, and we've been doing this since like 2005, because the transmon qubit, as I mentioned, you can't measure in any way that's sort of low frequency. The only thing you can do is use this Hamiltonian to measure. And so the way we measure kind of conceptually is we send a microwave signal through the cavity, and then the qubit is sort of like a polarizable medium that has a different polarizability. It shifts the frequency of the cavity. So if that's the transmission through the cavity, if the qubit's on, in the ground state, that's the transmission if the qubit's in the excited state, I can put a pulse through and measure. And I will project the qubit into down or up, depending on whether I get a high intensity coming out of the cavity or a low intensity coming out of the cavity, or depending on whether there's a phase shift of the microwaves going through. Okay? And just to remind you, right, doing a QND measurement on one of your set of qubits is, uh, you know, an absolute entrance exam requirement to playing with quantum error correction. Uh, so I kind of alluded to this fact yesterday. There's been remarkable progress on this. So when we first did this, we had to measure for microseconds, and the fidelity was 20%, 50% sometimes, which was enough to play with the qubits and understand what they were doing. Uh, nowadays, uh, so uh, especially if you combine that uh, with a paramp, a, a Josephson-based amplifier that's running at 10 millikelvin, uh, you can basically make a quantum-limited measurement of that signal going through, and it's very highly QND. So here is a qubit that has a 50 microsecond lifetime while it's being continuously projectively measured. And here you're seeing the jumps, the discrete quantum jumps between its two lowest energy states. In real time, it means that in 300 nanoseconds, which is much less than the coherence time of all the other stuff around it, I can learn exactly whether that guy is G or E, up or down, zero or one, for my ancilla. Okay? And so that's, that's been a lot of work, and it's really interesting, and it's sort of important in opening up this new stages of... Uh, what is the vertical scale? I know it was G and E, but what... Oh, so, I mean, this scale here is uh, arbitrary funny voltage units on some demodulated A to D converter uh, at, at room temperature. Uh, what, what you do, of course, is you do pi pulses, and then you, you can see what, what, the, what the vertical axis is. Uh, uh, so that's, you know, that's something which is fairly easy to, to calibrate. Um, uh, OK, so this circuit QED has lots of nice benefits. Uh, putting things in a cavity is really good. So, uh, for these 3D qubits, by the way, if it was in free space, its, it's T1 time would be a, a few nanoseconds. 
So we're already suppressing spontaneous emission and the coupling to the environment by many orders of magnitude, much more than has ever been done with real atoms, by the way. Uh, of course, you can uh, use it to wire up and entangle qubits. The, the loss, even in those planar things, is sort of like 0.1 dB per kilometer. It's kind of similar to fiber. Okay, you know, nobody really wants to string 10 millikelvin coax between distant locations. But well, my point is, even if I had like a really complicated thing that was a cubic meter, I don't have to worry a lot about the interconnects. It's actually more about mode matching and coupling and stuff. And again, in the microwave, good. Uh, we can do this high fidelity readout of the qubits. And as I want to say in the, in the rest of this now, uh, it's a really useful resource for doing uh, error correction. And people are doing lots of other interesting things, including you know, many body. Uh, uh, you know, there's things you can do with flying photons, or you can do nonlinear optics like squeezing and parametric down conversion. Uh, also, there's this nice field of quantum electromechanics that borrows a lot of concepts and techniques from this. Uh, so there's lots more things than just the quantum computing going on today. OK, so uh, yeah, so we're here, and we want to do feedback and quantum error correction. Uh, because now we have developed the coherence, the ability to entangle, and the measurements. So, so now, uh, if we want to think about doing error correction, what should we do? So there are several known architectures, right? There's sort of stabilizer error correction. There's uh, surface codes. And something we've been thinking a lot about is this so-called uh, uh, modular approach, which, if you like, is a bit like taking a uh, quantum network and using it as a programmable uh, quantum computer. Uh, and kind of the downside is that all of these things are pretty complicated. So as I said before, there's kind of a chicken egg problem. You want to build much more complicated quantum circuits so you can do error correction. But for those to work, they need to be error corrected. Uh, so do we just put our heads down and engineer the ability to do 20 of them at once? Maybe, maybe not. With this modular approach, what you need is sort of an error corrected memory, some ancilla that you have good local gates, and then the ability to do sort of remote uh, entanglement between those ancillas, which for example can be done by having signals that fly out, like I just showed, the sort of QND measurement that go onto some uh, uh, superconducting detector or paramp. And then basically your gates between your logicals, these red blobs here, are done using the, the teleported gate scheme of Gottesman, Chuang, and others. Okay. And something we like about this is that, well, from the engineering point of view, I have to learn how to make little boxes with a few quantum resources inside that work very well and tune all that up. And then I have a small number of fairly defined uh, operations I need to do between my boxes. And they don't have to work that well at all, it turns out. For sort of reasonable resource uh, overheads, you know, if those are 95% or 98% uh, uh, fidelity, it's, it's, it's not so bad, we think. Uh, and the other thing I like about this is that if you have a little bit of error correction built in here and then you have this kind of scheme, you can think of it as a quantum breadboard. So you can then do error, you know, if I have uh, seven of these modules, I can then do a stabilizer uh, 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 between these things. Or I can make a real toric code, or a surface code, or a surface code with variable range interactions or whatever. So basically, I want to play with my hardware. I want to learn about error correction, but I don't want to commit yet to a particular architecture because I'm not really sure what's optimal. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, OK, so uh, if we were going to do the straightforward Steen, here's the issue, right? We'd have uh, seven of our transmons inside this cavity, and then I have uh, six uh, uh, ancillas and six readouts. I would need six paramps, six FPGAs reading it at room temperature. I have to do very complicated classical but fast in sub-microsecond uh, logic and feedback. And what I've learned from our theorists and this suggestion of the cat codes is an interesting thing. This is a very silly way to do error correction. It's very inefficient. And the reason is as follows. See what you think of this. So we have you know, one qubit, and it's got some errors. And what we have to do is redundantly encode, which we do by adding a bunch of other qubits. So we made a bigger Hilbert space. But what's the problem? I had T1 and T2, or bit flips and phase flips on this guy, bit flips and phase flips on this guy, bit flips and phase flips on this guy. And essentially, you have tiny sort of not quite zero marginal returns. And we keep building and building and building. And we have more and more things that can go wrong, which is why there are all these syndromes. Okay. So uh, I also feel like it 
undersells a little bit the interesting physics here if you just say, oh, so we have to scale up in order to do error correction, right? There's a lot of really cool physics that's going on here in the process of trying to do error correction, right? So first of all, to remind you, right, what you need to do, here's one of your ancillas, and these are uh, conditional uh, gates. Uh, you know, it's already been sort of pre-compiled or written in a concise way here. Uh, you want to measure the sort of four-way parity. Remember parity? Uh, using this ancilla of those four qubits and the x parity of these and the z parity of those and so on. So what are we doing here? Well, we're working with a large dimensional Hilbert space. I'll show you experiments where we're using a comparably large Hilbert space already. Uh, you want to measure a symmetry property, okay, in a way which projects this thing back onto an eigenstate of that, uh, of that operator, that interesting multi-dimensional operator. We need to do it in a quantum non-demolition way. The act of doing these gates and making the measurement on that ancilla had better not flip any of these qubits. That would be bad. Um, and we need to measure fast with low latency, and then we need to do stuff uh, in response to that. And eventually, this is only one layer, right, of error correction. We need to concatenate and make everything fault tolerant. And okay, so there's a lot to be done still. So here's the kind of proposal that our theorists came up with. Uh, from the hardware point of view, it looks lovely. So we're going to use a really exotic state of light in a cavity as the register. And then we need one ancilla and one readout to monitor the relevant uh, error syndrome. And the reason, I guess, that this thing seems so hardware efficient compared to that is we're going to use a large Hilbert space in one object without introducing TBD, right? This is something I have to check, any new error mechanisms. In fact, in our cavities, we're, we know that there's very minimal dephasing. Matt asked about dephasing. So essentially, we only have one thing that goes wrong when we put many photons in the cavity. We can have a finite Q. So we have photon loss that happens at some rate kappa. And that's the dominant thing we have to correct. OK, so uh, first of all, I want to show you how we're encoding information here. Um, and we made, uh, this is a paper in uh, science uh, Last year, uh, what I think are the world's largest Schrodinger cats. Um, that is not my graduate student, Brian. Um, this guy is uh, working with a large cat, but he's doing a reverse Schrodinger experiment. I'm pretty sure he's dead already. <laughs> okay. That's Brian. He's, he's yeah, still healthy. Still well. yeah, no, Brian's doing fine. Yeah. And Gerhard's also fine. He's at Innsbruck. Yeah. So, uh, what I uh, want to do then in uh, the remainder of the time is sort of explain to you these cat states and how they can be used. So what's a cat state of an oscillator? A little different than a Schrodinger cat. It's not entangled with anything. It's just a superposition of that displacement and that displacement, right? So it's like I push the pendulum to both sides simultaneously, OK? And uh, if I do alpha and minus alpha uh, with a plus sign here, um, I have a certain distance between these, which is the average photon number. And this thing does decay more rapidly, right? Because I have n photons in here, the time between uh, each individual photon loss event is now 1 over n bar kappa, right? Um, but when I make this superposition with a plus sign, you see it's even parity, right? Uh, the other thing you can do is make a superposition with a minus sign. So you have, you know, displaced it that way and with a phase, displaced it this way. Now, how do you know you did that? Because um, I'm sort of i cheating here. I'm showing you the wave function. You don't have access to the wave function. If I look at the probability density, both of these have you know, the probability of the oscillator is both right and left with equal uh, probability. You can't tell plus from minus or even from just a mixture of it went both ways. Uh, but what you can do, right, is you can wait a certain amount of time and then the pendulum will swing back and interfere with itself if it's really in a cat state, if it's really in a coherent superposition. And what you should see then, if you look at the probability, is some fringes. And the fringes get tighter and tighter and tighter together uh, as uh, the initial displacement or the number of photons gets larger and larger. And of course, those are more easily destroyed by decoherence. And that's how you kind of recover the classical situation for you know, n bars a million or something. Right. Uh, so how do you measure that in, in uh, an experiment? Well, what you have to do is look at something like this. This is the Wigner function. Uh, so as a function of either the p or, and the x, or the, the q and the phi, our conjugate variables, 
what you want to do is you want to measure the photon number parity. That's what the Wigner function is, if you haven't ever heard of it. So it's that operator, e to the i pi a dagger a, okay? And uh, if you have uh, fringes here, then uh, you, that corresponds to this interference in the two blobs, and you know you've made a, a real cat. And ours is a cryogenic cat, so it looks like that. Um, these are the whiskers on your frozen cat. So uh, people have made complex oscillator states uh, before, both uh, sort of with Rydberg atom things and uh, with other approaches using superconducting qubits. But in both cases, the record is sort of, you know, superpositions of things containing up to maybe 10 photons. So what um, we were able to do, let me just check how we're doing on time, okay. So, all right, uh, is we make a two-cavity architecture here. So uh, it's this three-dimensional thing. We're gonna have one of the cavities be very long-lived. Uh, 50 microseconds in this case, and the other one very short-lived because that's going to be the one which we use to measure the state of the qubit and then infer what's going on in the other cavity. And we combine it with one of these parametric amplifiers so we can do, you know, sub-microsecond single-shot projective measurement on this qubit, which is simultaneously coupled with this dispersive Hamiltonian to both the uh, uh, storage cavity, which is the A, and the, and the readout cavity here, which is the B. Okay. so. Again, the interaction we have here is like this. Uh, it's this A dagger A times sigma Z of the qubit. So the, the B mode, the readout cavity, is just the classical readout hardware now. We can just eliminate that from the discussion. And here's what that Hamiltonian means. If I measure, let's say, the absorption spectrum of the qubit, I get a peak. But if I have populated this storage cavity with some photons, I get other peaks. And those other peaks correspond to uh, the energy it takes to flip the qubit. So this peak is flipping the qubit if the cavity is in vacuum. This peak corresponds to flipping the qubit if the cavity has exactly one quantum of energy in it. This peak if it has exactly two quanta and so on. So I can do a non-demolition measurement of the photon number. If I flip the qubit here, I know that it, and it does flip, I know that it's in n equals one. You can play lots of really interesting games here, okay? And, uh, you know, this is, uh, again, a sort of interesting Hamiltonian and a regime which has previously only been accessed by the Rydberg atom guys in the one group that can do those experiments. So uh, the first thing that our guys proposed and that we did, uh, let me do this quickly so we get to show you the, the coding scheme, is basically we want to go from a qubit that's in an arbitrary superposition, any location on the block sphere, to a state where uh, the... Uh, qubit is going to be in the ground state, okay, uh, but uh, the cavity is going to be in that same superposition of alpha and minus alpha. I want to make deterministically an arbitrary superposition of the oscillator displaced both ways at the same time, okay? And so using that Hamiltonian, there's a sequence of gates that you can come up with that does this. And again, my point, I think, is that these gates use that Hamiltonian that we're given and the ability to do like displacements and pi pulses on the qubit and the cavity. Uh, and it's a perfectly nice gate language, but not something that I think people really thought about before. Uh, so we can do it. There is a picture of a cat with alphas about three, so, or two points, so this is something like uh, seven photons on average or something. And you see the two blobs right and left and these nice alternating fringes here that tell you it's, it's a true cat state of the, of the field. And uh, this is what we get if we start with, let's say, the qubit on the uh, uh, equator of the block sphere, G plus E. Uh, in this particular scheme, if we start, let's say, with E, we get only this left blob. If we start with G, you get only the right blob. And you can tell whether you're this way or that way on the block sphere uh, by the sign of the interference fringe there at zero. Okay? And it's, this is a reversible operation. We've done it forward and backward. It's actually already in the first implementation 80% fidelity. So the, the mapping is, is fairly good okay? and can get much better, we think. And then we could make bigger cats. So you just push harder before this operation begins on your, on your oscillator. And uh, here's the fringes still uh, clearly going negative and showing you uh, uh, non-classical interference at something over 100 photons. That's so the biggest Schrodinger cat without Anyone. And by sort of making more complicated protocols with those things, you can make three component cats or four component cats like this. So this is an experimental measurement and this is a state of, this is a quantum state no one's ever made before, I claim. Okay. Uh, 
how are we doing on time? I'm getting a little long, huh? Four more minutes. OK. Um, OK, so what's special about those things uh, for error correction? So if I have one of these coherent states and I look at sort of the qubit spectrum, which tells me the probability of all the photon numbers, I see this kind of Poisson distribution that you all know and love very well, right? If I make a positive cat or a negative cat, remember I said this one had positive parity and this one had negative parity. And when you look, what that means, right, is there's sort of a Poissonian envelope, but this state has essentially only the even photon numbers and this one only the odd photon numbers. So here's how this error correction scheme is going to work. This four component cat can be thought of as a superposition of two things. It's a superposition of the positive parity uh, cat like this, that's this, and uh, also the positive parity cat that's like that. And those are two orthogonal basis states, okay? To the, uh, okay, to the extent, this is a continuous variable system, right? I'm assuming here that I've pushed my Gaussian blobs far enough away that I can ignore the tiny overlap. So if you want that to be 10 to the minus 6, use on average 4 or 5 photons, it's fine, so, okay? Uh, and so I can make any superposition of these two and I have a, a coherence, I have a, a qubit worth of information I can store, but I know that whatever state I've encoded, it should be in only even photon numbers. Okay? And now, of course, what's the idea? If uh, I start here or there or in any superposition and there's loss because my system's not perfect yet, I will go to that. See the difference? Blue fringe versus red fringe which is even versus odd photon number. So if I can track the parity of the photon number, tell me is it even or odd? Don't tell me the number. Tell me the number, game's over. Yeah, you destroyed something. <laughs> Absolutely. I've projected out of this big Hilbert space into a definite eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. If I can do this measurement, I'll show you really quickly here in the end, we can do that. What I do is I project from this big Hilbert space into a two-dimensional subspace the code space or the error space. So this is really the essence of quantum error correction. All right? Here's the idea. We're going to start in even parity. There's decoherence, which is the evil juggler. He may, at some random time, cause a photon to be lost, and we go from even parity to odd parity and back. And if I can track it, I can try to defeat the evil juggler. So here's a measurement using this system of, of the parity. Here's the way it goes. So we have two components. We have the one ancilla qubit and we have our cavity state. So if we start in a state of, uh, I'll just show you here, a state which is unknown parity, so a, a, a coherent state that has no particular parity, and we basically do a pi over two pulse on the qubit. Now this dispersive Hamiltonian acts, and what happens, remember, the qubit frequency is shifted by a certain number of hertz for each and every quanta I have added into my oscillator, okay? So, my pancake here, that's the n equals 0, n equals 1, n equals 2, so on. I've color-coded, of course, the even and the odds, red and blue. And at this point, we have a very large entanglement between all the photon number states and my ancilla. Uh, but the property of that Hamiltonian has a symmetry. We can make things where the shift per photon is exactly equal, almost. And so after a magic amount of time, which is 200 nanoseconds in this case, we end up with all the even photon number states pointing this way on the block sphere and all the odd ones pointing that way. Now we've really made a Schrodinger cat. My spin, my qubit, is entangled with many photons in the cavity. And they're distinct, macroscopically distinguishable states. Now if I do a pi over 2 pulse and I projectively measure G or E, I can force myself into one of these states. And so if you do the experiment, you see it, it works. The fidelity is actually quite nice. And you can repeat this measurement many times. It's a QND measurement. So uh, this will be like my last slide because I'm really extending the time. Uh, so we start here in a state. We make a measurement and put it in a cat. Let's say it comes out odd in the beginning. That's what the uh, Wigner function of the state should look like. And then each of these dots here is a measurement of the photon number parity. And what we can do is we track along. The purple thing is a filter that's using the results of the measurement to infer whether the state is even or odd. This is what we know must be happening inside the cavity. So it's a real-time tracking of the errors as photons are lost one at a time. So again, each of these jumps, we know a photon has been lost, but we don't know what the photon number is. 
uh, we only know that we've jumped from code space to error space and back again. Okay? And what we're doing right now with this is we're actually trying to see if using this information allows us to extend the lifetime of, uh, of, uh, of the information that we've stored inside. And I think you know, from that, we're going to be learning all sorts of interesting things about how you can really do these kinds of things. And uh, you know, what really matters in the hardware sense for quantum error correction. So as I said, this is the first measurement, I think, of photon parity in any system. Uh, it's the first repeated use of an ancilla in superconducting qubits, the first quantum jumps of light in circuit QED. And I think maybe most importantly, it's the first real-time tracking of the natural errors in a system uh, uh, by measuring a syndrome. So there are many examples of quantum jumps. This is the first example of quantum jumps that are not between energy eigenstates, but between two degenerate subspaces. So uh, anyway, let me thank all the people who do this work. And if there's any time left for questions, I'm happy to entertain. Thanks. Two questions. Dave. Do you just remember the parity and use it or, or back it up for the computation later, or are you intending to put the photons back? Uh, so, um, yeah, that's a good question. Obviously, um, the, the, the interesting thing here is the decay has two components. There's the deterministic loss of alpha as e to the minus kappa t. Okay? The energy rings down in a smooth way. And then every once in a while, the environment decides, oh, a photon has been lost and you change the parity. So if we encode and the separation is big enough, we can watch and just use this tracking. And as long as our states are still non-overlapping enough, we can you know, <coughs> extract the information at that point in time and, and, and everything is fine. We just have to use in a, in a well, you don't want to do it in a post-selected way, but use in a real-time way the information. If you really want to make it live forever, you want to also put energy back in. Uh, but to put the energy back in, you can't just displace again. What you need to do is add photons two at a time, or in the end, four at a time. Because really, our code states in the end, I've sort of glossed over a few details here. Our code states are really whether you're in 0, 4, 8, or 2, 6, 10. So you want to keep where you are, but put energy back in, and then interleave that with making a measurement of the of the parity to know when it's jumped. And so uh, my colleague Michelle Devere, using sort of parametric down conversion things, has shown that he continuously can, can continuously pump a two-component cat. That paper will be submitted soon. Uh, and you know, this basically uses a Joseph's injunction, again, and its Kerr nonlinearity to, to do uh, you know, fancy quantum optics things you can't usually do in the microwave domain. Uh, so there's a lot more to be done along the lines of doing these things. And I just described how to correct a memory, not how to do logical gates and stuff. And we're working on those kinds of things. And uh, there are some neat ideas. So let's uh, thank Rob again. Uh, OK, so our next speaker, continuing in the, in the device space, <laughs> we're going to hear from David Riley. Uh, on technology for large-scale quantum computing. So let's welcome David. Thanks, Krista. So in a similar way to Rob's talk, this is going to be uh, the advanced course of yesterday's uh, talk um, with quite a lot more detail. But I would like to keep it informal. So yeah, please interrupt and, and ask questions. I'm kind of a little <coughs> scared that. Uh, this is a pretty diverse audience, so I'm going to tr sort of go into some details in places, but uh, hopefully if you can sort of, I don't know, amuse yourself for a few slides, it'll refresh again and then something interesting will appear. Um, let's hope. So, okay, so the, the, the topic here is really exploring the issues related to controlling ultimately what we want, a large-scale quantum computer. Lots of qubits. Uh, and trying to understand what the problems are in doing that. And, and I'm really going to focus on this kind of layer here, that layer that interfaces directly with the physical, quantum physical layer where the actual qubits are, and try and explore some of the issues related to really this problem. So what's the complexity class of this classical hardware layer that you would need to control a useful machine, a useful quantum computer? I think for sure that 
even with error correction, it's actually a, a, a NP-hard problem. To do it optimally, okay. Layout, routing, wiring, optimal pulse shaping, clock distribution, timing sequencing, all of this kind of stuff is known to be uh, NP-hard. Okay, we don't have to do it optimally, but we have to go close. Otherwise, this is going to be an extremely difficult problem. And it's, you know, it's kind of ironic that we're trying to build a machine to solve certain hard, difficult problems. But in order to build that machine, we have to solve hard and difficult problems. And it, it would be, I mean, unfortunate, but kind of amusing. This is meant to be God laughing at you. <laughs> if it turned out that you know, the barrier between building a quantum computer can, that can then solve hard problems was that uh, this hard stuff got in the way. Hopefully, that's not going to be the case. So if you don't believe me that this is hard, um, you only need to look at what's involved in doing routing of wiring for the kind of printed circuit boards that are in your computer. This is just work from my group here. And I'm starting to really appreciate what's involved in doing this kind of wiring. This is, this is a pretty simple circuit, actually. It's a, it's a single FPGA and some kind of slots for other uh, peripherals and the like. It's, it's a few layer printed circuit board. Um, but it takes the computer some serious amount of time to try and find not the optimal solution, but at least something within some design rules and parameters. And you know, it's kind of known that, that all routing is, is really intractable. These are, these are hard problems, let alone doing the complexity that we're imagining doing for a large scale quantum computer. Um, so I believe that it's important, recognizing that this stuff is hard, to at an early stage, way before we need to, in some sense, at an early stage, really try and understand, well, what would be the smart way to put together the control circuitry and what, what is clearly the way that's just not going to work? And some people already, I think, have a pretty good idea of that, but there's, there's a range of opinions out there in the community, and I think that it's kind of time to start to flush out some of these issues. I like this quote from, from Mike Friedman in this recent article in the New York Times that says, it's actually the conclusion of this article, where uh, asked what you might do with a working quantum computer, he responds that the first thing he'd do is program it uh, to, to uh, be a model of improved version of itself. Um, and I think that that's exactly right. This is going to be some kind of bootstrapping evolution uh, as we start to build these machines and figure out how to use them and how to wire them and how to build the control circuitry. And just like the evolution of classical um, computing, it's going to take some evolution from there. The outline of this talk is to really drill down to some of the details. I want to go over uh, how you control and read out solid state qubits. And I'll tell you some details there. There's some interesting convergences that have only really started to happen over the last few years, where the time scales involved for coherence, for readout, and the like, are more or less the same across a range of different technologies. And that's kind of interesting from the point of view of control, because it means that we can start to develop uh, generic technology that will be useful and applicable for a range of different types of physical implementations. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about this architecture that I have in mind for kind of scaling control and readout that I discussed yesterday. And then I want to talk about, well, what is the technology, the classical technology, that is best suited for actually implementing this type of control? Is it CMOS in silicon? Is it something more advanced? Uh, what's that parameter space look like? And if I have time, I'll drill down into some more details here about actually what we have in mind, what it looks like, um, and, and show you some pictures of a few cool things. So this idea of convergence, if you go back 10 years, 15 years, uh, and go to a conference on, on quantum computing where there are experimental approaches that are presented, it was extremely different in terms of what people imagined these machines would ultimately look like. The time scales involved for doing single qubit rotations, the coherence times, the T1 lifetimes, the readout times, stretched many, many orders of magnitude. And what's happened over the last decade is that some implementations are kind of fallen off the table, and others have caught up, and others have kind of jumped ahead. But there's largely a convergence, at least on, on most of the parameters, um, between the various flavors of solid state qubits. I think the superconducting qubits are, at the moment, way ahead, as Rob just showed. They're doing extremely interesting and sophisticated things. They're leading the race there. Um, but in terms of just the time scales that are relevant for control, I think that they're kind of comparable between these different systems. Um, for instance, so for readout, as I mentioned yesterday, readout now 
is really very similar for different systems. It's about detecting the amplitude or the phase of a, of a microwave signal. Um, and so how this works, just, just briefly, it's actually a technique that was pioneered by Rob. Um, going back some time now, I think. That's 15 years, something like that. Uh, it's Thanks been around for a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but it's, it's become the standard way in which people do measurements now. All, all qubits in the solid state are basically read out using this technique. And what it does is it takes a, a microwave tone, shines it down a coax cable onto an impedance matching network, and down here, you could have a device, an electrometer, like something like a single electron transistor, or it may even be a resonator. Um, the impedance matching network just transforms that impedance so that it looks like 50 ohms or some characteristic impedance that you want it to. And that impedance is going to change depending on the charge state or the qubit state of the device. Um, what you want to do is detect a change in impedance. And if you have a change of impedance, then what you have is a reflected signal, some partial reflection here that's proportional to the change of impedance. And so readout amounts to detecting that change in phase or amplitude of the microwave signal that comes back up your dilution refrigerator through a chain of amplifiers, gets mixed with the carrier signal, and what spits out the end is just the signal proportional to the change in impedance, which is then proportional to the state of the qubit. Even with the best amplifiers around, and at these low temperatures, uh, you're still adding considerable noise to the system, classical boring noise that has nothing to do with the state of the qubit. And there's a, there's a big push in the community to try and squash that noise, but it's already, it's already pretty good. And uh, that leads to integration times in the order of less than a microsecond, depending on the details. Um, so this is actually a table for spin qubits only, and you can see that there's a range here. Maybe the state of the art is a little better than this one microsecond now. I think that's 800 nanoseconds from uh, Amelia Kobe's group. And similar times, you know, are kind, of, are kind of popping up in various different contexts. So again, I think the superconducting guys are maybe a factor of five or something better than that. Um, but it's, it's all between 100 nanoseconds and one microsecond is the state of the art. From the point of view of algorithms and error correction, the time that you're spending doing readout is important relative to the coherence time. So if you're spending an enormous amount of time, let's say you're working with one of these qubits or something down here in the milliseconds, you're doing a lot of integrating of that readout signal in order to figure out what the state of the qubit is. Meanwhile, your other qubits are decohering. So this is an important parameter that sort of gets lost a little bit, that readout takes time and not all systems are the same. But moreover, there's actually fundamental limits on how fast you can read. So the two parameters that control how fast you can read are how strongly coupled the readout detector is to the qubit and how much noise you have in the system. Turns out that both of those parameters, the coupling and the noise, uh, are up against quantum mechanical limits. So in the case of the noise, there's some quantum noise. This could be shot noise of, of electrons in a detector. It, you know, it's equivalent to, to the uh, photon noise that you might have um, in a cavity or in an optical system. And you can only couple the readout detector so strongly to your qubit, even imagining that you can turn it off, do something coherent, turn it on, do a strong projective measurement. You can't turn it on so strongly. Um, you know, there, there are limits on how strong that can be. It actually turns out, uh, and this is not something that I think is very well understood, but it turns out that the fine structure constant sets some limits, at least for electromagnetic coupling, on how strong the readout detector can be coupled on the scale of nanometers to these types of qubits of that scale. And I think it's those two parameters that mean that the time scales for readout are converging, let's say, around the 100 nanoseconds or so um, ballpark. So that's an important number, I think, to have in mind for, for how algorithms will proceed. Yeah, so you can see that that's the case here for the, the superconducting devices. Just like readout, there is a convergence of um, control approaches and the semiconductor community for a long time has been using what people call DC pulses, which is a kind of odd term. Um, it, it basically means rectangular waves that tilt and rock the potential, the chemical potential of a semiconductor device. Spin qubits and semiconductor qubits are evolving now to what superconducting qubits have been doing for a long time, and that is controlling the state of the qubit using microwaves in a very similar way to how one does uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. So if you know anything about NMR, or ESR, um, it's, it's that kind of approach that's now 
being used more or less for all of these solid state qubits. And the way it works is you take a carrier, that carrier frequency is set to be the energy level splitting or close to the energy level splitting of your qubit. There's an envelope that's mixed with that carrier to produce a pulse. And the width and amplitude of the pulse then sets, sets the, uh, what's called the tipping angle, the superposition between the two basis states. So if I have some pulse here, depending on how wide that pulse is in time, how large it is in its amplitude, that's going to control the angle of my, of my state vector uh, on the block sphere. So as a function of increasing the width of the pulse, what you'll see, you can, being the term Rabi oscillations, um, I would love to actually, this is a, someone should do this. I'd love to image search Rabi oscillations and go back in time year by year over the last 10 years and see what the images look like. You see the whole community is growing and they all start to converge and resemble the same number of fringes, the same kind of duration of pulse width, the same kind of contrast. Um, that would be a cool thing to, to do. Um, but if you've seen these before and you wonder what is that wiggling thing that's decaying, it is indeed just the state vector processing around from north pole to south pole as you increase the width or the amplitude of that pulse that's driving. Okay, so that gives you, turns out, if you can control the phase of it, then you can have arbitrary control. You can control and put, put your state vector anywhere you like uh, on the block sphere. As Rob mentioned, the superconducting qubits are approaching a millisecond, and semiconductor spin qubits are already around that ballpark. It depends on the particular flavor. Maybe electron spins are hundreds of microseconds. Nuclear spins are at the 30-second mark and somewhere in between the two, depending on what system is, is kind of like a millisecond or, or so. There's still a big variation in the time it takes to do single qubit rotations and two qubit gates. I think that's the widest parameter. So that, that number actually ranges from picoseconds for uh, exchange coupled electron spins. That can, that's, there's data that shows that that's in the kind of 10 picosecond. It can be faster, but it's hard to detect, hard to measure, up to even tens of microseconds or hundreds of microseconds for, again, some semiconductor systems. I think with the superconducting guy sitting at the few microsecond level and getting faster. Again, a convergence, though, of, of what it actually looks like from a control point of view, what you need in the lab to do these types of experiments, and what we want to integrate into some kind of scalable approach to control many different qubits. So as I showed yesterday, the universality of, of uh, Quantum computing means that from a control perspective, life's not so challenging. You really just need to be able to map some subset of gates, single qubit and two qubit gates, into a control waveform that implements those gates. The qubits, really, all you're doing is moving that state vector around the block sphere or bringing two qubits together for coupling, and that's being controlled by a microwave pulse. So depending on which gate you want to execute, you're going to play a different microwave pulse to your qubits. The order that you play those pulses is how the algorithm is going to be implemented. Um, so if you take a circuit model diagram like this and think of these different symbols as being, of course, different gates, but now think of them as being different microwave pulses with different shapes and different widths and different amplitudes, then what you need is a technology that can basically take a family of different waveforms and then steer them to the appropriate qubit at the appropriate time. And so what, what's really involved, I think, is an approach that separates out the generation and playing of those different waveforms that execute different gates from the problem of steering those pulses to the appropriate qubit at the appropriate time. And the reason to kind of separate this is that these guys are you know, microwave signals. Um, they're hard to generate. They're expensive to generate. We don't want to generate many of them. We'd like to generate as few as possible. Um, and trying to have one of those signals or a bunch of those signals tied to each qubit is a real pain. I want to kind of separate that and let, let these guys fly on a bus and then pick them up and drop them where they need to go at the right time. The same thing applies for readout. If you want to read out qubit 3, then I need some kind of routing layer here that switches qubit 3 to a readout bus. And you know, there's some addressing here that makes that happen. 
So that's, that's the sort of proposal. That's the dream. It's actually pretty challenging to imagine what some kind of switching matrix or routing matrix might look like that can steer analog waveforms in the gigahertz that can also connect them to a readout bus without any insertion loss. Any loss here is going to translate into a loss of fidelity of the readout signal. And so um, we care about that. So what kind of technology would you have in mind for implementing that kind of a scheme, at least to get started? So as I showed yesterday, um, here's a kind of cartoon Mickey Mouse version of, of that scheme projected onto today's dilution refrigerator technology. And you can ask the question, where should I locate the different components of this scheme? Where should the microwave generators be? Where should the switching routing be? And the first thing is, the, the switching matrix that steers these pulses, that should be very, very close to the qubits. Ideally, it should be integrated in the same substrate in the same device. Because then you can use lithography to make all of these switches. You can bring in very few inputs. You only need the number of inputs equal to the number of different gates, the number of different waveforms. But then this is a pretty complex object. It wants to take some addressing string and then spit that out into however many qubits you have. You're going to need the same number of switches or even more. Um, so that's a complicated thing, and you want to make that with lithography in a, in a, in a clean room, not wire it up um, with cabling. So that guy should be cold, and it should be close to the qubits. What type of technology could you use to implement these types of switches, this kind of routing? It's a challenge because you need broadband. You need a bandwidth of, of you know, let's say, a few gigahertz. Um, depending on the, the details of the pulse, uh, you need a few gigahertz. So that's, that's hard. It's going to dissipate some heat. You don't have a huge heat budget to deal with. You need to switch very quickly. OK, it's starting to get challenging. I don't think it's a mechanical relay. Uh, we had in mind using a MEMS device like this based on these PZT switches. But it turns out that they're pretty slow, and they're not that great at, at, uh, at gigahertz. Um, after a while, you realize the answer is already there. It's in many devices already. It's a field effect transistor. And um, we've started making uh, HEMPs, actually, high electron, electron mobility transistors, but they're just they're FETs, built into gallium arsenide substrate, because that's also the substrate of our qubits. And we're starting to actually use them in the context of steering pulses to the qubits. So I don't want you to pay too much attention to this data. The point is simply that a university group, a collection of graduate students, you know, don't have to work too hard to make a switch that looks like this with reasonable performance. Is that the end game? No, this is where you hand it over to people who really know what they're doing, and they can take this concept and start to optimize the microwave performance of these types of devices. But already, we're getting something like you know, 60 dB of on-off ratio, which is the key parameter. We really want to turn these switches off so that the qubits don't see anything um, when they go dark. And when you, when you switch them on, uh, we need that high on-off ratio. So pushing this out to higher frequencies, I think, is pretty straightforward, but it's not something that we've done um, yet. The size of those guys can be shrunk down below microns. In fact, they can be in the limit where you're starting to see ballistic transport. Um, so very little power dissipation. Uh, HEMS have been demonstrated to be able to switch on fast time scales and you know, can pass gigahertz signals up to actually 20, 30, 40 gigahertz. Um, so, so that really seems like a viable technology for implementing this type of thing. Yeah? So, David, do I see the, the insertion loss is something like 10 or 20 dB? Yeah. So for that particular data, it is. And, and we don't care for the control. But for readout, we care big time. So for control, I can just crank up the signal a little bit, and I can live with some attenuation. There's usually attenuation in the line. Um, but obviously, we want to get rid of that. I don't see any reason why that can't be um, squashed. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, this was sort of generation one. In fact, I think we have data that's around about 2, 3 dB. At least for us now, some of our control pulses, we can't tolerate 20 dBs of loss mm -hmm. Why is that? on the cold stage. It's just too much. The peak power is too high. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, this is a very key aspect that if you're going to dump heat even from your pulses, where it's got to go somewhere. So I think there's two approaches to that. One is to bring the pulses in and bring them back out, terminate somewhere where you can dump heat and only pick up you know, enough of the pulse that you yeah, the need. More, the more loss you have, the better the reflection. <laughs> the other way to go is to say, I don't want a dissipative switch. I want a reflective switch. And I think that's a better way. So here's a, here's a reflective switch. Um, and it's built out of the same technology, but it's kind of an interesting device. In fact, in fact, I would dare say that it's an analog of a Josephson junction, but it's lossy. 
It's not so lossy, but it's lossy. It's, you can map current to voltage and inductance to capacitance. And what it is is a voltage controlled capacitor. But you have the same nonlinearities. In fact, you can, you know, if you didn't have loss, you could, you could think of doing some pretty cool things. So the way it works is I take a, a, a transmission line that consists of some ground plane separated by a dielectric and a conductor on top. And I can make the impedance of that geometry to be more or less what I like if I have control over that geometry and dielectric constant. Um, if I change the impedance, then I change the characteristic, then I change the reflection. And what happens in this device is that the ground plane is now formed not by a metal, but by a two-dimensional electron gas, basically the inversion layer in an FET. And so when you put a voltage on the gate and you deplete that inversion layer, you deplete the ground plane and you change the characteristic impedance of the device dramatically, thereby changing the amount of reflected power. Um, so again, not trying too hard, this works pretty well out to, to reasonable frequencies. And again, you're getting something like 40, 50, 60 dB um, of on-off ratio. And you can see here, OK, the insertion loss is still, in this particular one, not great. But I think that that's optimization. That's you know, simulation of, uh, of really what's going on with the electric fields and current density. We've taken this concept and, and basically are using it uh, to do experiments because it's, it's useful now for the experiments that we're doing as well as for scaling up to larger numbers. Um, for semiconductor spin qubits, we have the added challenge of often needing to add DC voltage levels to, to our microwave signals. And so we have to bring in various bias T arrangements as well. Um, but it works pretty well. And we're scaling it up to now a 10 by 10 um, array of these types of switches. And I think where this is going is in addition to kind of lifting the burden of, of, of not having to wire a separate microwave generator coax line to every single qubit, I think the bigger advantage is actually that it allows you to calibrate the amplitude of the pulse for each qubit. So if you don't have identical qubits, which you won't, then we need to be able to adjust the amplitude and ideally the phase of the microwave signal for each qubit. And so I think that this kind of switching array may allow for that. That's something that we're trying to benchmark at the moment. So rather than operate it as a switch where it's open or closed, you can operate it as a programmable or variable attenuator where you need to go in, you need to calibrate um, how open or closed that switch is such that the amplitude of the pulse gives you the right rotation on the block sphere that you are after. Um, so making IQ modulators, uh, phase shifters uh, out of this kind of technology um, seems, seems pretty straightforward. So let me shift gears now and, and move up a stage. I've talked about this switching array, this routing kind of matrix. I want to talk about what kind of technology that could be used to implement the logic, the classical logic, and the data converters. We've got to make decisions based on readout events. So that's an analog waveform that will be turned into a digital signal from some kind of analog to digital converter. And then based on that signal, we want to make some decision about what to do next. That then translates into analog waveforms that then go to the qubit chip. So what technology should we build these ADCs, DACs, and logic out of? And what temperature should it be located? So as I said, the switching array is cold. But I think there's also benefits to having the data converters and the logic cold as well. So some of those benefits are uh, the footprint and the scaling. You can start to integrate all of these devices. We'd really like to take advantage of superconductivity in all of the cabling and the interconnects. By doing that, you can make very dense um, interconnects that don't take up much room and don't bring in uh, very much heat into the cryostat. The signal fidelity and the bandwidth of, of superconducting interconnects is, is much higher. Uh, you can reduce the latency by bringing it cold because then it's close to the qubit chip. I think one of the key drivers at the moment for us is the noise performance, the improved noise performance that you have by, by lowering the thermal noise for your data converters. Um, there's some electromagnetic interference issues that seem to improve as well just because of the size and the length of cabling that you have, straight capacitance and the like. Um, and there's the enhanced clock speed that you get uh, by cooling this stuff down. Um, yeah. yeah. Superconducting shielding is also yeah. Very, very good. Right, right, right. So it gives you lots of opportunities to get down electromagnetics. Yep. There. So using yeah, so using lead shields or niobium shields 
um, you can take advantage of that as well. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a funny thing in that um, the astronomy community really goes to some, some length to cool detectors, uh, similar for the, you know, the kind of particle detector guys. Um, they're cooling the detector to improve its performance. They're developing cryogenic electronics so that the detectors can run at those temperatures because that's where the noise is lower, that's where the dark count is lower. For our systems, it's only very recently that we've said, you know what, the qubits have got to be cold, why don't we also take advantage of the fact that it's cold and lower the system noise in various other ways. Um, it seems, seems kind of strange that we wouldn't have taken advantage of that earlier on, but I think it's, it's just where the technology has evolved. So how hard is it to get electronics, you know, commercial off-the-shelf electronics working at 4 Kelvin? What, what can go wrong? Um, most people think what goes wrong is that there's some kind of thermal contraction, uh, and that certainly happens, and if you cool the thing rapidly, yeah, you can crack it. Uh, but that's not the, the main mechanism of failure. The, the main reason that semiconductor devices, silicon devices, fail at temperatures, let's say, below about 50 Kelvin, is that in a silicon transistor, you have dopants, and those dopants basically have some kind of atomic potential well here. So this is a, you can think of a, a positive nucleus with its inner shell electrons, a positive ion core, uh, is creating this, this uh, atomic potential. And then there's a bunch of bound electron states. And of course, there's an ionization energy, the energy that it takes to kick an electron out of that potential and into the conduction band where it can then contribute to um, a current flow through the device. And what happens is at low temperatures below sort of 30 Kelvin, the thermal energy isn't sufficient to ionize those dopants. So you don't then have electrons in the conduction band. The electrons that were in the conduction band are now dropping back to their uh, atom, their donor atom, and are locally bound, unable to contribute to current flow. Um, so that kind of freeze out means that the characteristics of your transistors change drastically as you get to temperatures below sort of 30 Kelvin, and eventually you don't have any electrons in the conduction band um, to participate in transport. What we found is that, um, of course, that's true, but what's missing there is the presence of large electric fields. And if the electric field is sufficiently large, then the field itself can ionize the electrons and keep them in the conduction band even down to temperatures well below 4 Kelvin. Okay, so that's an effect that's known, and it turns out that, um, I guess, out of, out of kind of luck, the evolution of transistors these days to high-K dielectric materials and to much smaller gate um, dimensions means that the electric fields are naturally already sufficiently high that you can operate at low temperatures. So the challenge then is to say, well, I want to work with just the transistors. Everything else, all the supporting circuitry, power conditioning, clocks, comms, that's going to fail. So you've got to get rid of that stuff. Put that at room temperature or at higher temperatures um, and just work with effectively bare dye chips. That's what we've been doing in my lab for the last sort of six to 12 months. And these are some of the things that we're demonstrating. This is a FPGA, a ADC, and a DAC integrated on a six layer board, lots of effort to um, partition analog and digital signals, and that's running at 4 Kelvin in you know, ultra-high vacuum in a, in a dilution fridge. Works pretty well. Is it compatible with qubits? These things are pretty noisy. You know, you've got large signals there that are running these type of FPGA and digital devices. Does that generate a heck of noise? Uh, is it compatible with, with quantum systems? Well, as far as we can see at this point in time, and we're only working with a single qubit, but we don't see any change in the parameters, at least of spin qubit devices. So we've, yeah. yeah. So your uh, FPGA and DC, they are also uh, running at this low temperature, or you have separate them out? The FPGA and the data converters all integrated on this circuit board are running at 4 Kelvin, and the qubit is running at 10 millikelvin, but they're in the same. With your high K, uh, it's commercial off the shelf, it's Xilinx, and I can tell you, you know, the details, and there's some tricks to keeping them alive. Okay. <laughs> you can reprogram them at 4 Kelvin, um, and they live, but uh, there's some tricks. Yeah. Do you know what, what the official uh, temperature range is for these parts? Hmm. Published. Yeah. Published. Oh, yeah, I do. It's uh, minus 30 C, or minus, four, yeah, minus 40 degrees C. Yeah. And I think that that comes mostly from mechanical 
uh, issues related to yeah contraction and yeah. Okay, so if you bring it all together, um, how does it work? This is so the FPGA at four Kelvin routing and switching at millikelvin. I haven't talked about this, but this is frequency division multiplexing of readout signals, also uh, superconductivity on sapphire at millikelvin, and a spin qubit device. You can bring them all together, wire them up, and then if you like, you know, secure a shell to your FPGA in the bottom of your dilution fridge, ask it what the temperature is down there, and then send it some instructions to direct these pulses from, from uh, one electron or the other. And so what we see in the data is that you'll see sort of these lines here that correspond to transitions of single electrons. For spin qubits, this is the, the typical diagram that's used to tune up the potential landscape of uh, a spin qubit. And what this shows is that this doubling corresponds to um, where we're steering these pulses, basically to surface gates on, on the chip. So it more or less works. We don't see really any change in the parameters of the qubit at all. So in this kind of, you know, in, inspired by how, how straightforward it was to get this stuff working, we're kind of pushing ahead now and, and really trying to develop more sophisticated data converters. Uh, we'd like to put arbitrary waveform generators at 4 Kelvin with, with greatly improved noise performance. Um, they're also much cheaper, even if you factor in the labor costs of, of you know, students and things like that. Um, we pay them a lot less in Australia, you know. This is a, a kind of motherboard solution with a series of daughter cards. You can choose different, different bandwidths. Um, we're using DACs uh, at the moment that are kind of tailored for spin, spin qubits, but there's no reason we can't substitute them out for, for a higher bandwidth DACs, DACs that are more you know, appropriate for the, the superconducting community as well. Um, that's what it looks like, in, again, in the fridge. You can see there's some power distribution that has to come down from room temperature. There's two uh, coax lines. One's a clock, and the other one is the digital communication channel um, for sending and receiving data from, from the system. David, in, in yeah. that picture, um, the, the copper plate is the thing that's at 4K, right? It right. looks like there are chips that are kind of like not, that are kind of like hanging out there that are. Um, I... These guys, so it's, yeah, I, I should show you a picture of what this copper frame mount is, but that we designed that to push hard up against um, the various chips. Now, you could ask the question, when you say 4K, what's the actual internal temperature if I were to put some kind of thermometry on chip? Well, obviously we can't do that. I, can, I mean, you can, if you want to, you can dissolve the, the uh, epoxy of the Xilinx processor out and try and get at it, but good luck getting it to work after you do that. So we don't know. We don't know what the temperature is inside. It probably self-heats a little bit. Um, at the moment, that's a good thing. You know, I think that that keeps it alive a little bit. It's probably not at 4 Kelvin. We think it's probably around about maybe 10, 15 Kelvin at the moment. But the, the goal of the, the copper plate is that it's... To thermalize it. <clears throat> but it is in... Uh, you're trying to get it in contact with every one of the chips on that uh, The The key ones that really benefit from being cold. So there are some things there that we don't care. We just want them close. We want them on the printed circuit board and it's really about interconnect and wiring density and they just need to be located there. We don't care what temperature they are because the performance doesn't matter. But for the DACs, we want them as cold as possible because the architectures of DACs that we're designing for are made to take advantage of the fact that you're two orders of magnitude lower in temperature than room temperature. So those guys should be thermalized. And you know, we use the usual, usual tricks that the low temperature physics community knows about how to thermalize things that you know, are not metals. So what? how do you handle from you know, some part of it is in 4K, the others are in milli K. Mm. So, so the interface, how do you handle that? Right. So uh, what we're really trying to do is take advantage of superconducting transmission lines below that go superconducting, let's say, below 9 Kelvin. So if we're using niobium-based superconducting transmission lines, then we can take a lot of signals with, with a, a very small um, cross-sectional area and bring them down from 4 Kelvin to, to millikelvin with you know, moderate heat loads, um, but very low loss in the you know, electrical loss at microwave frequencies. And that's what we're really trying to take advantage of by having some of this stuff located at those temperatures. Otherwise, we have to work with electrically lossy uh, transmission lines, um, which is not so bad, depending on what you're trying to do. 
but I think ultimately for scale up, particularly for readout, less so for control, um, lower loss is better. So what, what comes next? How far can you get with silicon CMOS commercial off-the-shelf technology? Well, hopefully I can report on that in, in you know, next year or something. I think so far so good. We've started a program uh, with my colleague here, Philip Leong, who's also from the University of Sydney, to start to design uh, ASICs for cryo operation. That's something that's going to take us some time, but I think that that's a path forward. Beyond that, I'm, I'm kind of inspired by the parallel path of the you know, semiconductor industry in general to move to various other materials. Um, most of these guys, 3,5 materials, indium phosphide, which is not on that list, are now very embedded in a lot of commercial applications. If, you, if you're owning one of the latest Agilent uh, oscilloscopes or storage scopes, those things are powered almost exclusively at the front end by indium phosphide. Um, so this stuff is starting to emerge into commercial devices, and the driver for that is enhanced clock speeds, um, but we're happy to take advantage of any, any, any progress generally in the kind of semiconductor field. Beyond that, I think ultimately um, superconducting technology, flux logic, that's really about you know, manipulating uh, single flux quanta is, is likely to be the final kind of emergent technology that, that appears for this type of application. So let me show you something controversial, see what you think, see whether you agree. Um, pay attention to the Y uh, axis. Uh, th this is in, in agony, extreme physical or mental suffering uh, as a function of the number of qubits. And what I'm drawing here is just the technology for classical control. Okay, so you can do brute force and it's really easy at the kind of one and two qubit level, but then it starts to get pretty painful pretty quickly as you scale up. I don't know exactly what the slope is there, but you know, it's something like that. Um, my view is that, that silicon uh, CMOS, low voltage, low power CMOS, is going to take you pretty far. It's not to say that there's zero agony, but the agony is not growing so rapidly until you start to hit, I think, hundreds, maybe even a thousand qubits, based on the, the numbers that we have at the moment for heat dissipation, clock speeds, and the types of things we think we have to do. Uh, after that, you can probably step up a little to gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, or even something more exotic, maybe graphene, carbon nanotube-based FETs. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there that's likely to kind of come online when we're at this level and starting to be interested in those technologies for control. Um, and that takes you a little bit further, by which point flux quanta technology will likely start to emerge as something that you can you know, download, install, and run in cadence and design the circuits that you want to do and pump them out with foundries. But I think that that's, you know, that's going to be needed out here but let's see how far we can get with, with semiconductors um, at the level of hundreds to, to thousands of qubits. There's certainly some interesting work to be done and some powerful um, quantum computing to be done at this level and this number of qubits. Okay, how much time have I got? Two minutes. Ooh, okay, I'll go fast. I just want to show you something pretty cool. How about the cryogenic technology? Often people say, you know, a dilution fridge is a kind of fragile, small object um, and if you Google quantum computer, actually, it turns out quantum computers look like dilution fridges. In fact, they're kind of one and the same, as far as I can tell. Um, and if you don't know anything about quantum computing, you, you could be misled. Let me come back to that. You could be misled to thinking that it's actually um, something to do with getting to really low temperatures. So I don't know how many people saw this, this article for, about D-Wave in Time magazine, but it starts off, this is the opening paragraph, that astronomers have been wrong and that the coldest place in the universe is actually in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, look, the coldest place in the universe is actually in a small city directly east of Vancouver. Okay, and uh, you, they cool it down. Of course, you have to quote, quote in Fahrenheit. It makes it sound even colder. Minus 459.6 almost two degrees colder than, yeah, okay. Um, a number of people asked me about this and, and were really fascinated by this. And I, you know, now that there's no cameras around like there was yesterday, I'm happy to say that I toured D-Wave and uh, I, you know, I, I didn't say anything for the first hour. I was given a detailed presentation 
on a dilution refrigerator and what temperatures it can actually get to and how marvelous that technology is and and you know out in deep space it's cold but here it's even colder and um, coming away from that it's 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 not it's not unreasonable to mistake quantum computing technology with actually a dilution refrigerator so okay what's possible is cryogenic technology going to be the bottleneck, is, is that our problem? We're dumping heat there with classical control, we're bringing in cables, they're interconnected. Is that the problem? Take a look at this. This is, this is a paper from 2009 uh, from Giorgio Frassati and Arlette Ward, um, who basically uh, own and run Leiden Cryogenics, a company that supplies commercial dilution refrigerators. Um, check out these specs. So uh, this is, this is uh, one ton scale cryogenic detectors for rare event physics. That's what the interest is. And they're installing this underground, in an underground laboratory. It's a large cryo-free cryostat cooled by pulse tubes by a high-powered dilution fridge. About 10,000 kilograms of lead will be cooled to below 1 Kelvin, and only a few construction materials are acceptable. The detector will have a total mass of about 1,500 kilo, must be cooled to 10 millikelvin in a vibration-free environment. Here's some more specs. Take the, have a look at this. So 10 millikelvin for optimal operation. The detector array, and I think this is, you know, this, this kind of ties in with what Rob was saying about 3D uh, transmons, and people get worried about the size of those things, but the detector array is one meter high and 90 centimeters in diameter. It needs 2,700 wires. This is up and running. Um, they had to make the whole thing out of material that doesn't have any radioactivity in the background of the material, 30 centimeters of lead shields in every direction. And I think it's this last sentence that is really important for our community. If we're really serious about building machines and running them, this is going to be important. So it says that this cure or measuring time can be as long as 10 years. The experiment needs to be stable, service-free, and high-duty cycle running for 10 years. <laughs> The fact that that's up and running now, that's 2009 they wrote the paper, and from what I understand, it's going pretty well. That's where we are today. I'm, I'm not too worried about cryogenics. That's, that's what this thing actually looks like. This is a previous version, again, of, of what uh, Frasati has built. That's one ton of gold-plated copper sitting on the end of a dilution refrigerator in, in Leiden. So that kind of technology is pretty advanced. I'm going to skip very quickly, uh, 30 seconds, just for the aficionados in the room that are really interested in hardware, let me just show you a few things, and if you're interested, we can kind of talk um, maybe at lunchtime. Quantum computing is a little bit different from the commercial world in terms of the interconnects. Uh, we're operating, of course, at low temperatures, sometimes in magnetic fields, um, and frequently in a, in a sort of situation where you want to change out samples all the time. So you can't take your chip coat it in epoxy, seal it up, and forget about it. We need to get at that thing regularly. Um, so that's led to an evolution in interconnect technology. This is uh, some recent work from my group at trying to bring in large density uh, wiring. Uh, again, microwaves and DC connections. Our, our most recent generation actually looks like this. You can see the dimensions of this thing. It's pretty small. It's bringing in, OK, not so large numbers, but it's, it's starting to get up to you know, hundreds of, of wires that are needed to interface and, and fit within a package that's small enough to go into the you know, bore of a, of a superconducting magnet. Let me stop there and um, take any questions. Thanks. Can I ask one? Uh, the curve with agony. Uh, Thanks. I would like to weigh in with my uh, yes. version of how agonized I am. So uh, <laughs> the number on the x-axis is fiscal qubits? Uh, yeah. yeah. And you're thinking dots, or you're thinking other things? Because in, in, a lot, in most of our experiments to date, we have only one wire in and one wire out, even yeah. when there are multiple channels of readout. Yep. multiple qubits. So we standardly run three or four experiments in a fridge and we have something like 30 coaxes already there. Yep. So for us, the brute force isn't until we're at 100. Like We're working on buying systems yep. that are room temperature that will work at 100 qubits yep. for us. Yep. So it's kind of not... Well, yeah, so I, I definitely... Agree. Being a bit, no, I agree with you. So um, in general, the, the curve is most nice of thing to think about, but it's not... 
Uh, I, you know, I agree. Most of the agony. Not brute force yet. Said the brute that's force. right. Most of the agony, are, even for spin qubits, is the microwave waveforms. The generation, the steering, the logic that's needed. It's mm -hmm. mostly logic, actually. The logic that's going to be needed to do fast feedback. Right. And I think that's, OK, I still think superconducting qubits are, are yeah. have some advantages, but it's not so different. All of the slow DC, DC wiring for spin qubits I don't think that's much agony. It's interconnect density, but it's not dumping heat, and yeah, it's OK. You have the cost per channel down in electronics to under $10,000 just for off the shelf room temperature stuff. Yeah. So it's only money to brute to yeah. the Yeah, in some ways, I would say you're on, you know, I mean, this curve. I didn't say whether this is cold or not, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in some ways, you're saying you're kind of agreeing with this curve with the caveat that this is at room temperature. Okay, then there's going to be some pain when you go here because it can't be at room temperature. <laughs>